<laughs> okay. Welcome everybody to the late night chat. I missed you guys. Um, I just got out of, off of a conversation with my best or one of my best friends, Adrian, and we were literally screaming Baba's name for like, I was driving home in the car and we were like, Mess! I have so much energy right now. And I'm so excited to share it all with you guys. So I'm in a good place. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'll get more serious. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about removing debris from the heart. And I was going to read the email, but I decided that we don't really need to do that. So basically, I mean, I sent out an email kind of, I'm working with this book, um, that Michael Kane wrote. He's a Bob lover. Maybe you guys know him. It's called heal your broken heart. And I wasn't doing it. Everybody, I got all these messages saying that I'm sorry about your breakup. I didn't go through a breakup guys. It was just, <laughs> it was just, I'm just working on the book so that I can like give more love. Um, and something that it touches on is going through all of your heartbreaks that you've ever experienced, you know, and not, I'm not just talking about from a partner or a relationship talking about like the dog that died when you were a kid or the best friend that you lost and understanding how much that hurt your tender heart, not in a critical way of like, why can't you get over that? Or like, oh, my heart's so sensitive, but actually honoring it. And then what I, my experience of working with the book was, I was like, oh yeah, it makes a lot of sense why I have fears around loving or I have hesitations around loving. And yeah, how do we bring Baba into that? So that's what I've got. Um, I don't know if you guys feel inspired by that or if there's somewhere we can go with it, but I thought it brought up a lot. I was surprised how much I wasn't, I honestly wasn't expecting that much when I opened the book. I was like, oh, we'll see how this goes. And there's a lot of emotion in there. So how is your heart with Baba? Margie, Baba, Baba's often told people the importance of purifying the heart, making mm -hmm. the heart pure. I mean, it, it doesn't really work that well unless it, you know, the more pure, the better. It just works better. So it's a great topic. Yeah. And the heart, I mean, I don't know if this is your experience, but the heart is... I, I, maybe fickle is the right word. I kind of feel like once your heart gets broken, it wants to love, but it, it, it needs a lot of encouragement. Like it gets tripped up very easily because it's so tender and it has this abundance of love, but it also creates blocks for itself. I don't know. That's my experience. Maybe that's something you can speak to. It doesn't really have a layer of protection around it. I mean, I guess that's our job to protect our heart, but how do you, stay, how do you keep your heart open while not putting it in harm's way. What's, what, up, what's, the, heart? what's the heart? <laughs> what's the heart? What's the harm? What harm are you talking about? Um, I don't know, having someone take advantage of you or, uh, I mean, that's a really good point. Or, you know, ha I guess someone being unkind having, having your heart hurt. What, I, but what I, are the kind, what kinds of experiences uh, hurt, hurt the heart? I mean, it seems to me that it has a lot to do with, with uh, wanting and uh, attachments. And so if there wasn't wanting and attachments, we really, no, nobody could really hurt us. So we could approach it that way, as opposed to being uh, being in a position to be hurt a lot, and then try to heal those hurts. Yeah, but then you know something I often think about with that is, I think about Mara, and how much Mara, how much pain Mara's heart was in when Baba dropped the body, and so, you know, we talk about oh, don't have an attachment to this, but the purest soul in the universe had 
such a deep grief and her heart was so deeply, I don't know. I just see it a little bit differently. I mean, I get what you're saying that I think that it is kind of true. Like, Oh, if we just really believe in Bob as well, and we don't get attached to anything, but I think we can, you can really get into spiritual bypassing there and being really critical of your, of yourself. Like, Oh, why can't I just detach from that? When the, when I have compassion for my heart, and that it, that it's able to love, it's a lot easier to free it. But I want to go to Diane and Terry. Uh, rush to us. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for instance, when I was um, five years old, <clears throat> my mom had a pretty intense heart attack in the middle of the night. And when I woke up the next day, she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And everyone around us was in so much grief that they, and the, you know, they just didn't know to like comfort me or take me aside and try to explain it to me. They just, you were seen, but not heard in those days. It was very different than it is today. And um, so I, I didn't know what anything meant really. And um, I just knew my mother wasn't there, which was pretty bizarre. And, um, and in those days, you know, they didn't have the kind of pushing you out of the hospital and she was gone a long time. And then, and, you know, some kind of recuperative situation. And then when she came home, they put a bed, uh, like a, a pullout bed in the living room because she couldn't even do the stairs. Those were the beliefs in those days. It was very different than it is today. And um, I mean, something like that is always inside me, you know? So when, you know, it was a, a major, um, you know, I felt totally abandoned. And so I, I, <laughs> when Di leaves the house, I have a couple minutes that I need to talk to myself and, you know, make it okay for my heart or that child within or all of those things. And certainly in a, a lifetime, there's been a lot of other ones, but that one was very intense. And as I said, it's, I've done tons of therapy and, you know, and now it's kind of like, I know Bob is there for me. So I feel um, more of a freedom in my, you know, my aging than I've ever felt before, which is amazing for me. And uh, cause he doesn't go away. Unless you forget it, you know, to say his name, he's he's there with you. So um, he's helped me with it, which is really amazing. Yeah, and one of the things that I learned in these squares, I think from Mr. Wolverton particularly, is that when love leaves, when your heart breaks, that just gives Baba room to come on in and set up some real estate. Did I quote you right, Jeffrey? Jefferson? You're muted. Yeah, I mean, her, there's, a, there's a line from um, Mother Teresa where she said a, a prayer of hers, Lord, break my heart so completely that the whole world falls in. Mm -hmm. Who thinks, who thinks in that way? I mean, it's well worth it if you can bear it to have everybody. But you have to, and, and, and they would ask uh, Erich, you know, if he thought, it, if Baba was going to break his silence, and he would say, when your heart cracks open and you begin to live from your heart, then in you his silence has been broken. Say that again, please. Uh, let's see. He made it up, Diane. He so, made it up. I can't remember I'll listen that. to the recording, Jeff. It's okay. When Erich was asked, you know, when is Baba going to break his silence? And he said, when your heart cracks open and you begin to live from your heart, then in you his silence has been broken. But it's, it's, uh, I mean, there was one master that Francis uh, Robazon writes about who would only take disciples if they had been in love and lost. 
if their heart had been broken. You know, so. But we we do recover, if mm-hmm. if if the ego doesn't come in there and and smart and and come up with some ultimatum. We, uh, we're going to come back and be able to love even more. Yeah. I feel. I mean, I, heartbreak, you know, I don't, I think it's this thing that in the Bob world, especially it's like, oh, you shouldn't feel heartbroken because Bob is always there in your heart. Or, you know, that's sometimes the message that can get delivered. But I mean, I think heartbreak is what allows us to feel empathy for others. Because if you just never experienced pain and someone comes to you and they lost their family member, you know, you can kind of have an idea of what they might feel, but only when you feel what someone has felt, can you really understand the pain that they're in and love them through it. And, you know, I see this all the time in the work that I do, you know, I'm looking at astrological charts all the time. And in every astrological chart, something that shows up as like a a very, like a, a gifted healing ability Another way to read the aspect is one of the most traumatic experiences that a human can experience, right? Like they they go one and the same. And I think, you know, having heartbreak is, it's a, an initiation really into being able to love. It's not, yeah, of course it's traumatic and we have to hold space for it. We have to like process the human emotion that's related to it, right? That's our job to deal with. But past that, it's just an initiation, it's something that we can have gratitude for because it cracked us open and made our, our hearts ready to receive. And, you know, what this book was kind of opening up to me was like, wow, I've had my heart broken a lot. I got to clean some of this up. Right. And it's not just these epic. It's like we have our heart broken all the time. And it, it, when you take inventory, it shows you how deeply you're really loving in every moment. It was, I mean, in some ways it was like, oh boy, I really have my heart broken a lot. But then in some ways it was also like, wow, I've had my heart broken so many times. This is like a beautiful thing that I can love so completely and so fully that my best friend in eighth grade, like still made an impact on my heart. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, I would say you just have to get rid of the scar tissue. Yeah. Yeah, so it can flow through. And this, I, uh, I, I've read some books along the way. Maybe uh, I don't know. I think I got introduced about twenty-five years ago to uh, Richard Carlson, who uh, he's passed away now. He died quite young, like in his thirties, maybe. But he he uh, wrote a, a several books. Uh, you can be happy no matter what, I think was the first one I read. And then he, he wrote, don't sweat the small stuff. And it's all small stuff. His, his concept, uh, his, his way of therapy was quite different than the uh, uh, therapists that try to discover what your um, uh, experiences, uh, traumatic type experiences were, and then kind of go back and relive them and and uh, somehow heal it that way, but he he didn't think that was that was quite the way. He and he came up with all kinds of ideas, and the one that I'm thinking of now is one that I often think of. Uh, you might be surprised, but it was about um, he used it as an example. I'm just I think this is an example, but we could probably use it for a lot of things that might break our hearts. And he said, if you have a favorite mug. Your favorite, like I have a mug with Baba's chicken drawing on it that I bought 40 years ago and I've been drinking out of it every morning. And I think if it slipped out of my hand and it, you know, the handle broke off or something like that, uh, I, I would miss it. But because I read this this little tidbit in one of, in this book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff, his his suggestion is don't wait for something to happen that takes away something that you are quite in love with or attached to or is part of who you are and all that. Don't wait. See it in your own mind's eye. Experience it now 
that is broken, that is gone. Really feel it now. Don't wait till later. And that, and and then when you already when it if it ever ha would happen, it may never happen. It's not the, that you worry about it. You just kind of experience it. What would it feel like that mug was gone, or if that if my uh, mother died, or if, if different things of that sort? Um, what would it what would it be like? And and how? Uh, and can I and can I be like that? Can I can I live in a world where I'll lose things and and uh, and have that occur? So I kind of like that idea. I, and there's a song by David Wilcox that uh, is along the same lines too that I heard quite a few years after that. Um, so it's just just an idea of uh, having something that can help you now as opposed to dealing with something later that you feel breaks your heart yeah i think that would work <laughs> <clears throat> it's an experiment yeah. jeff do you have your hands up but if you want if you want me to call on you put the i mean it's fine you can go now but put the icon up so we actually see you next time Sure. J. Bob, everybody. I think there are certain situations in life that attachment does not apply. Not too many, but one of them regards somebody we love who dies, as with Mira, with Baba. But we've had people we love very much who have died. And I remember seeing a movie many years ago with Trimpa Rinpoche called Sunseed. And in it, he said, when somebody dies, it's very natural for people to grieve. This is something that he basically said in very clear words, that's the normal thing. So I've tried in my life to be discerning. Certainly I have many attachments, but when somebody dies, it's natural for me to grieve and feel very sad sometimes I say, well, Baba gave me my beautiful parents, these beautiful gems, and I look at it that when Baba wants to take those gems, his treasures back, I, I, he's doing, I, I think of Baba as the Lord of Karma. We talk about this karma that we all have unfolded in our lives. And when things do happen, that may not be to my liking. I realized that the Lord of Karma, that Baba is running the show. And it seems often that that door is closed, but a very more beautiful door opens somehow, some way. As far as how does one heal, how do I heal from a broken heart? That's a really, really important aspect of our walk with Baba, with God. How do I heal my heart when it's broken? I'd like to talk about that with us. How do I heal? How do you heal when you're really, really, when you have a broken heart and something happens that really hits you? And, I don't have this great wise answer that I wish somebody would have. Maybe you do. But that's why I came tonight, because I thought from Margie's writing that this was about how does one heal their broken heart. So I just, as I said, I, I look at this as it's all God's will. So not my will, but thy will, O oh Lord. Not easy. It's intellectual, I know, to some degree, but. Yeah, but it's still, I mean, I think it's a it's a really good question. And Rich, Rich, I see your hand. I'm not ignoring you. I, but I mean, I think that sometimes in the Bible, and I'll just say this, we act like, oh, well, oh we're just going to give it to Baba. But that's not what our experience is. And I'll say that for probably each and every person here is like, it's really easy to sit on here and say, oh, just give it to Baba. 
But when that happens, that's not what it is. And so I think that there is a need to talk about it. Like that question that Jeff asked, we have to talk about it. Because when someone dies in someone's family and I say, oh, just give it to Baba, that's not helpful. That's not loving. And Baba tells us to be loving. So you're breaking an order by doing that. It's discrediting someone's feelings. And so, I mean, I think it's a really beautiful, I'm glad you said it like that and posed it that way. Um, let's go to, let's go to Rich. What I, what you brought up is, for me, it's a really deep subject. It's a little confusing in my own mind and heart, because, um, I think there's, um, there's another very subtle issue, very powerful, subtle issue behind all this. Uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in, I'm intending this to go straight to a Baba lover's heart and soul. So this is not the sort of conversation or direction you could suggest to people without Baba. Maybe someone deep on the spiritual path, I don't know. But there's the suffering of your karma, which goes on infinitely. You'll get attached and you'll and maybe your consciousness grows. Maybe you're a better person or whatever. You go through the flux of life. It's always going to be that way. But then there's being with Baba and him dissolving shit for you taking stuff away, you know, uh, and he, he can work like Jeff has made this very clear. And I believe this, he can work very, very slowly on some of this stuff. So slowly that, you know, 30 years down the road, you're beginning to wake up to what, Oh, that's what that is. Oh my God. But ultimately we know that we each are responsible. So I like with Ron's analogy, I had a very, beautiful handmade coffee cup. I just love that sucker. I was so proud of it. And I was painting a porch and it was on the rail and I reached around to grab something and I kicked that coffee cup right off on the cement and it busted into a million pieces. I thought, geez, I did it to myself, you know? <laughs> and I think a lot of my stuff is I did it to myself. But with Baba, something more, much, much more is going on. Uh, I know Jeff is thoroughly familiar with all this and he sees so many people and, uh, but I, I met a woman on the center, the, I think it was the last time I was there. I can't really remember her, her first name. I do know who she was because we talked a little while and she told me she's related to a, a famous American Baba personality, was married. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, um, he moved on without her and she'd been on the center many, many, many times but only as a participant in the family life. And so here she was on the center the first time, just wondering who is Mayor Baba really? Who really is Mayor Baba? And what a story, you know? And I tried to talk to her here and there, but she was really grieving, mainly the loss of that, that particular marriage, you know? Um, and, uh, but she was there to ask Baba, what, who are you? What is this, this suffering, you know? And I think that's what Baba does. He will take the deepest part of your soul and start, you know, changing some of the elements so that you end up with an awakening one way or another. And when you can give that realization, when you can share it with Baba, like Jeff goes to India every year just to clean off some of the debris that he's collected. And I, I've only been there once, so I'm bloated, you know, but, but I know why he goes every year because he's smart enough to know it's the ultimate way. Let Baba have it. It's long term, <laughs> but it's, it's just the way that suffering of lost, like you're pointing out, Margie, I think that's for Baba lovers. It's how do you talk about it? I can't, I don't even really have the right discourse. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And, you know, something that I, I'm going to be candid here. And like, I think we talk a lot in the Baba world about like, we don't, we don't actually say what we're feeling. We talk about our feelings. We talk about, oh, the spiritual path, but every day somebody's agonizing. Like if I was to come on here and say, oh, I just give it to Baba. It's like, that's not true. Yes. That is the ultimate goal. I'm trying, but if I were there, I would be God realized. 
And sometimes it makes, like, I get very passionate about it when I hear people saying, just give it to Baba because it's so hypocritical. Because if you really were giving it to Baba, you wouldn't be here, but you're here figuring it out and you have to feel your way through it. And so to sit here and tell someone, oh, I, I don't know, it really, it really, really bothers me because I've seen people, you know, come to the center and I was lucky enough to be there for a lot of my teens. So, you know, I saw a lot of different people come. And the only way that I ever saw people feel Baba's love in others or feel it from the center was when they were listened to, when they were heard, when their heart was like, when there was care for their heart. I mean, I, I witnessed plenty of times when somebody would say, oh, yeah, this happened to me or like, I'm grieving this or this happened. And someone would say, oh, just give it to Baba. And that makes that person disconnected. That hurts their heart more. And I, I just, yeah, it really, I think the this conversation I agree. Baba makes it so easy for us. And we picked a path. We picked a spiritual master. I mean, I think we picked the fast pass. Like if we were at Disneyland, we'd be the first one on the rides. But it, I don't know. I feel like I'm on a monologue here. So I'm just waiting for somebody to put their hand up. <laughs> Your monologue to Baba. Yeah, I'm like I'm taking this is actually between me and Baba. I'm just making you guys bear witness to it. I mean, but seriously. Yeah. Healing. We Go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've heard that refrain over the years, you know, give it to Baba. I mean, in my own case, I've found when I really, my heart has really been hurt and broken. If if I accept it, it expands my heart. If if I feel abused, then I I kind of lose the lesson. I mean, if I come away from it smarting and angry, I haven't opened up wide enough. I'm just talking about my own experience, you know. Uh, but if my heart is hurt and and I feel well, my the two things that I found the most difficult in this life with Baba accepting is when I'm treated unjustly or unethically. I had to get over that. Those kind of hurts. I would react to, and I don't think it wasn't until I got beyond that that my heart was able to enlarge more. You know, uh, you How know. How did that work for you? How did that process work for you, Jeff? Um, by reacting to the un, un, uh, to being unjustly treated or unethically or unkind, cruelly treated. I was only, I was stuck in a reaction. I had to go beyond into a response, beyond that. And that, that, that's, that I would say took decades for, with certain people, you know, who were, were very, um, you know, by worldly standards, very cruel. But I actually, they helped me grow more than all the people that lavish love on me. Oddly enough, but I had to kind of stop reacting and open wider and have compassion for myself and for them. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, it, it was, oh, well, we've got a hand up over there. I'm free. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> so um, I want to talk about Give It to Baba. So I think for me, years ago, you, way before um, we knew Baba or anything about that, we were in Reno, Nevada at a luggage trade show because we had a retail store at that time. And I was totally messed up about something. I don't even remember what it was. And we're standing by the window and it's floor to ceiling windows and overlooking all of Reno and then into the mountains, and on the other side is gorgeous Lake Tahoe, just setting the stage, very vast, expansive. And Terry says, put all those thoughts and feelings into the palm of, into your hand. So I closed my eyes and I did my best. And she said, now give it to Reno. <laughs> and I get, I've been giving it to Reno for a long time until I could oh. hear and give it to Baba. But without sounding too cocky, and I don't mean to, be, or flippant, 
It is a, <clears throat> a verb, an active verb for me to give it to Baba. It gives me something I can do. Whereas a lot of times when I would get trapped in a rabbit hole of hurt thoughts. feelings, huh? Thoughts. Yeah, of you know, thoughts that were just taking me down. I didn't know how to stop it. I didn't know what to do with it. And so give it to Reno or give it to Baba. Give it to Baba is a little bit stronger than give it to Reno. I can tell you that from experience. Of course, I have to do the work. Of course, I have to feel my feelings and assess what they are and do the work that it takes to unpack them. But some things I can't fix. And Jeff says, Baba wants that stuff. And I believe Jeff, because look at that face. He would never lie. But it has been very, very helpful for me. It has been, I haven't felt alone. And I haven't felt isolated because of that. Does that do anything, Margie? Yeah. And I, Jeff, you're muted. Jeff, I was like, yes, to yes. say, I mean, I mean, I, I, I had a great influence from Darwin. Yeah, it's not like just give it to Baba. You know, you have to. I mean, Darwin's saying you can't heal what you don't feel. You have to feel the deeper the the feeling, the deeper the healing. You have to spend sometimes days with it before giving it to Baba. It's not some kind of frivolous thing. So, I mean, it's a deep energetic exchange, you know, from my uh, heaviness to the going, uh, going toward his ocean. So, um, th that, that was what Darwin referred to as really giving to Baba. Uh, but it's, it's not the, uh, I mean, there's sometimes people give me, bring up problems, and I can see, boy, that is really heavy, you know, and, and it's out of my depth and it's out of their depth, and I say, go over to the lagoon cabin, feel it as deeply as you can right there in Baba's presence, and try to give as much of it as you can, you know. Uh, but uh, it's, but like I say, it has to be deeply felt piece by piece and everything, and not just, oh, Bob, I give you my my job, you know, or whatever. It just can't be kind of some frivolous thing. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really glad you said that, and Diane brought up that point, too, because that is really what, you know, if you ask how you heal a broken heart, yes, it is giving it to Baba. We're here to give everything to Baba, but it's not just frivolous. It's not just so easy and so simple of just like, oh, just give it to Baba. Like, no, we're he's yeah. our he's cheering us on and holding us up. We just have to allow it to be. But Ron, I saw your hand up. Yeah. I uh the what's striking me from my own experience uh, and is that uh I was I'm thinking of different situations where I've lost. I've suffered loss and grieved that, it, and and they the they're very different. Uh, I'll give some examples. Uh, I, I'll even name some names. Uh, but uh, but what what I think we're giving is not our feelings. We don't give our feelings of grief to Baba. Uh, I don't think we need to do that. Uh, the the feelings of grief are the ones that remind us that what we have given to Baba and what we continually have to give to Baba, which is I, my, me, and mine, all of it, all of that is, is, uh, is what I want to give to Baba. If I, when I bow down to Baba in the, in my morning prayer, during my morning prayers, which I do several different times in that process, uh, that's what I'm, that's what I'm offering up. Uh, everything that I, uh, that it has to do with me and mine and, and my a attachment to the world and all that um, because it, it belongs to him. I have to, uh, I have to think in terms of that. So, but as far as my heart breaking and, and these kinds of things, 
I think we're all different, but I can think of some examples. Uh, a friend of mine who I've known for 45, 50 years or something like that, uh, just recently died. Uh, he was older than me, so he's pretty, he's up there uh, in age. And, and he, had, he had a health issue. And uh, the fact that he lived as long as he did, and I got to know him for as long as I, I have, uh, I, didn't, I didn't suffer from hearing you know, that he had passed away. Uh, in fact, I think you know, it, he, he, it ended his suffering. So it, that wasn't something that I suffered uh, for or grieved over. Whereas the people close to him and who saw him all the time, I could grieve for them um, because they're they're going to miss him. Just like the uh, two of the cats that were in our family just disappeared at different times, and they never came back. And now that was something that went on for a long time because every time. I would see anything in the house or do anything that related to a cat experience, I would feel the loss. I would think, oh my God, uh, Josie is not here or, or uh, Mika is, is gone. You know, she's not going to be here to, for me to look at her or play with her or, you know, any, let her in the house or let her out of the house and stuff like that. Uh, that was, that's very sad. I know. Uh, Richard had something like that, I'm sure, with his dog. Uh, but I also uh, recently heard about uh, 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 Jamie. Uh, oh my God, what's Jamie's? Jamie Newell. No, 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 no. Jamie who? Leonard. Leonard, yeah. What? Jamie Leonard. Yeah, Jamie Leonard. Okay. Well, I knew her in in the Bay Area. We used to sing together, and uh, I, I I was pretty close with Jamie. And so when I heard this story, this story really got to me. Uh, that you know, I, I felt so that she was grieving. I was sh trying. I was sharing in her grief. I'm sure she's uh, grieving, but I was sharing in her grief, although I hadn't seen her in seven or eight years, something like that. I haven't seen her once uh, or talked to her. Uh, I didn't know her husband at all. I didn't know who, who he was. I, didn't, I wasn't even sure that she got married until a couple of years ago. But anyhow, uh, there's all these different kinds of experiences that we have and feelings. And I don't think I want to get rid of those feelings. Uh, I want I want more feelings. To tell you the truth, I I sort of feel like like I'm an unfeeling person sometimes. But so uh, I'm not giving Bob my feelings, but I am giving him <laughs> myself, and he's going to take whatever he wants. I let him make his own decisions. Beautiful. Yeah, like Darwin used to say. Time wounds all heals. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, when, when you when you say that, Jeff, that Darwin said, "Time wounds all heals." Yeah. Just <laughs> a few minutes ago, I think it actually Ron said, "We're thinking so much of I and me and mine," and my mind is doing sort of a little bit of a twist in a good way. I heard somebody say once, we're all addicted to ourselves. We're all addicted to ourselves. And if you, if I listen to myself and I listen to yourself, how many times am I hearing the word I? And it's not meant to be a judgment as much as to say we are. Addicted to ourselves are... When I think about that, it allows me to realize, forget you, Jeff. Yes, of course you want this desire, you want that desire, you don't want this person to die or that person to get old. But you're addicted to yourself, Jeff. But get out of the way of yourself, even a little bit, get out of the way of your ego self and just let God's will do what it does. It's not gonna be the way you want. 
uh, I don't want to sound like I know what I'm talking about, but when Baba was Buddha, he said it. Life is with suffering. When you know the script and you realize, when you were a kid especially, uh, I didn't learn this till I was maybe in my 20s, 30s, but life is full of suffering. It is. And then we have a chance sometimes here or other places, how do I deal with my suffering? That's the reality. <clears throat> and the next time something really hurtful happens, I'm going to try to remember, forget yourself, forget this I. You have no control over anything. I have no control over hardly anything. I'm not talking about driving or coming online with us, but most of life, I don't have any control over it. And if I can just remember that it's not my will, it's thy will, oh Lord, uh, I'm, I'm processing in front of you how I'm trying to use this opportunity to, when things happen to bruise my heart, and it's not intellectual, somehow there is a, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking last thought, someday, some way that, Baba's grace will permeate my being so that I accept reality as it is. Just radically accept what is. It is very difficult. And I'll, I'll say one last thing, because it's really something that has helped me. There's a Buddhist teacher. She's a young woman from California, Tara, T-A-R-A, Brack. She must have dozens of talks on radical acceptance. How do I radically accept what I don't want to accept? And he does share along the lines of what we're talking about. Radically accept what is that I'm not going to like. Either I radically accept or I continue to suffer. And how to do that, that's, you know, what Baba mastered, obviously, and we're trying to somehow be able to heal on heal our bruised hearts. They get bruised pretty easily. <laughs> we all know that. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Um, let's go to Rich. Um, when Jeff was talking, suddenly it popped in my head, um, and I don't know how the thoughts related, but um, there's certain personalities I've always enjoyed. And the theme of this thought is that um, even though for me, this, what we're talking about, this process is a very deep part of my psyche and my ongoing life as I age, I have less to do externally. So I'm more focused on my own internal thoughts or experience or feelings, but, and I'd rather be more involved with life. But then there's that problem of uh, uh, this practical about my age and ability, energy and all that. But it brings up something else, and that's an excitement about being alive. And I've always really enjoyed people with what I call big personalities. I've always loved that. And I I remember when I was young and, and lived in New York, I always thought of the classic New Yorker, maybe New Jersey personality is that big, that big thing, you know, you know, <laughs> and there were always there's always somebody like that. Um, I think Jeff's got part of that he brings it to you in in baba terms which is really wonderful uh margie's got that kind of energy and i know where this thought began as i was wondering because margie's in the business or getting in the business of helping people encouraging people i think particularly women but um uh, to not to sort of revel in the act of being alive and so when it comes to Baba, you don't give up on life. You know, he's told many people, go back to your job, take care of your kids, you know, uh, you know, then come and see me when you have time and money or whatever. But and so I know that uh, Jeff's line of work, so to speak, has been just like that. Uh, to me, it was always like that. It was always great to see Jeff. I expected to get some form of awareness of myself that wasn't there previously on the center. But uh, I know Margie must be like that. And there's a lot of people that are like that. Uh, people that, that sing a lot, you know, like Pam Rubenstein songs. They seem so seriously, sincerely uplifting. And I can't do that, you know. 
but there are people that do. And I, my life would be very dull without people, other people like that. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you, Rich. And, you know, to your point, Bob is like main order for us. I mean, I guess to think of him, but also don't worry, be happy. Right. And, you know, we get so focused on how the suffering is. And even Eric said, uh, don't get addicted to suffering. And so I was thinking, I wrote this email on, I think it was Monday night or Tuesday, something like that. And last night, without expecting it, Baba answered my, because I kind of was in the, like, how do you heal a broken heart, right? Like I'm sort of discovering that my heart has these wounds. And he tells us so clearly, mastery in servitude. It is not about like, it, the more that we can help others, heal so like if we can see our heartache as a way to serve others that is where the mastery of ourselves come in when we get so focused on me my experience my suffering yeah you have to feel it I do agree with that and you have to honor it but I think it does come back to how do you heal a broken heart it's through service to others like if you're hurting and somebody I mean I've had plenty of experiences where I was hurting I wanted to lay in bed all day and wallow in my own pain and one of my friends says oh let's get out and do this you know and you go play with kids you go talk to somebody all of a sudden you're not thinking about yourself anymore and he baba makes it so clear i mean even look at his mandali like his mandali you could say they suffered so much like if you look at what the lives that they live they had to give up everything just about i mean the ones who were close to him he told a lot of them to go you know go back live in the world but his mandali that were with him all the time they were so busy serving others that they didn't have time to, yeah, they didn't have time to obsess about their heartbreak. Mm -hmm. They felt it. They experienced it. I mean, Erich, from what I understand, talked a lot about how painful it was, how it was like, you know, both things existed together, but it's so that we feel it so we can heal it and we heal through helping others and by sharing with others are, I think sharing our pain too. Like I know so many people just that I've talked to some of the most cathartic experiences and most loving and healing experiences for other people is hearing that they're not alone. And maybe it's just sharing in the heartbreak for the sake of someone else, not to talk about how hard your life is. Does that make sense to you guys? Am I? Yeah. You know, Thank uh, you. thank you. You know, I was, um, as you know, I was there when Mara passed on, and you know, and there, like I say, there weren't many people at all. But I, I watched the women Mondali, and they were completely stunned and devastated. Uh, but after, after. Uh, at the end of the day, I was walking up the tomb and I kind of flashed on how I would describe the women Mondali. They gave their hearts completely to Baba, but they, but they never lost their soul. And it's, I saw the, the, this image of a, of a mountain in which there was a volcano and all of the trees are laid bare. I mean, they're all they're all devastated and everything but the but the top of the mountain still has still has that snow it's still it's almost like they 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 didn't hold back in giving their heart even though one day they were going to be devastated by it but there is the, there's the soul in there that is going to survive and if they had kind of protected themselves i don't think they would have they, they they would have reached the, the they wouldn't have reached, reached the soul the way they did. But I mean, for some days, you know, you just uh, I was around them and they they really didn't want to talk. They were very uh, in a state of absorption in trying to process that suffering. But in the end, they had Baba. They had the, the, the they could see the top the top of this mountain was still there. Even all the forests were devastated. So, I—I uh, I mean, I—I I think it's worth giving our heart to anything, 
even though we lose. Uh, it's, uh, you know, that's kind of my feeling, rather than, you know, being, being protective. But, well, I, I can't say that. I mean, you have to be careful not to get your heart unnecessarily hurt if it blocks the flow of your love. I find, I mean, I've talked about it. If you get your heart too close to somebody who has a prickly personality, they can hurt your heart and then your love shuts down. So Baba said, you know, not too near, not too far, as far as the heart. Yeah. If your heart's too, if you, but if your heart's too far back, like it is with many people, they, uh, <clears throat> no one hurts them, but they don't, they miss out on the joy of the give and take of love. But if they go too far out there, and I mean, I have to be careful, but, you know, uh, that I don't get so close that I irritate somebody or they lash out and, that, and they hurt my heart. Because then if they hurt my heart, my, the flow of my love gets broken. I have to retreat back, you know. I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah, it does. It does. In other words, it's my responsibility to keep my eye on the flow, uh, that flow of love. And if I, <clears throat> I have to place my heart in such a way that it doesn't get unnecessarily hurt or it isn't so distant that no one can touch it or reach it, you know. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Not too near, not too far is what Baba said. I always take that as as a guideline. Uh, and it's, it's different with each person and it's different even in an individual conversation. You and I might be, you know, very close in, in feeling and everything, then we get onto the subject of politics and suddenly, whoa, whoa, I better back off here a little bit. <laughs> no, I mean, not that our, your, yours and my politics are different, but with my neighbors, I might have a nice heart exchange, but then we get on this topic of politics and I realize, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've uh, hit a landmine here. Anyway. Jeff, it looks like by mentioning politics, you hit a landmine. Two people just put their hands up. I know, Ralph is, you know. Get a, get a Ralph. Are you there, Ralph? Oh, you're still muted. Uh, yes, I, I was reflecting on the tone of the conversation thus far this evening on the topic. And, um, Though I haven't been reading the discourses ardently lately, hearing what you're saying brings back that Baba somehow in, in the discourses and, and throughout his life did, did discuss these things and did bring them to light. Ver in terms of like wants versus needs, right adjustment that life is right adjustment to each other, learning the art of right adjustment to in relationships. And um, uh, the yet I feel like we have to get it on our own. So I'm I'm rethinking, but what the thought I had, but I have to say, I'm not sure it's a viable thought. The discourses strike me as being fairly intellectual in jargon. And I don't know if that's because of Baba. Or because of the, but Baba selected the interpreters, and they were all philosophers. And Don Stevens is pretty intellectual guy, and uh, Darwin was more a heart guy, I think. Though I didn't know Don at all, and I just knew Darwin a little bit. And that little bit was not to wake me. Wish that I'd known him a little more, a lot more. 
But um, I never even met Don Stevens. So Darwin talks about the, the same things Baba talks about in the discourse. In fact, he takes right off of them, you know, and explores them. How do we incorporate those things? And it is, it is those are the, the just the conditioning we have overrules intellectual conviction. And then it means you've got to go to Baba. And um, in the sense of, and then that involves right adjustment of your relationship with Baba. I find myself being like with Baba's picture, oftentimes far, far too relaxed about it, casual, you know? You talk about talking to Baba. Well, I've, I've blamed it on others, you know, over the years. Oh, I talk to Baba. I discuss everything with Baba, you know? So they do, God, you know? And I thought, yeah, I need to do that. So I started making it up, you know? And then it got to be like, yeah, I think there's something there, you know? <laughs> and there is something there. Yeah. But it has, I think, wants and needs. And, but there's always a romance and infatuation. Huma says passion is man's worst enemy. And yet we thrive for passion. We love, we just want passion because passion will carry us through to our romantic, to the romantic, to our romantic dream. Some people achieve things and some don't. Some live through it and some don't. I shouldn't say that. Now I'm going on. But Baba, we do have to come to terms. And it's good, it's good to give pause for thought. And, and meditate on things that are have purpose and meaning. Yeah, you know, uh, Ralph, what you said about passion, passion, it comes from a Greek word. And the root of the word passion actually means to suffer. So, you know, we chase passion, oh. but it's suffering. We're chasing yeah makes us feel alive well, it or... means you feel fired to achieve your goal to for your purpose you know if it's to uh, you know the, the, the story of uh baba's disciple baba gave him the task of getting the moss to perform, to produce the play and the must to play all the roles for a Gopichan play, a complex story. And what was that disciple's name? He uh, had a tough life with Baba, but he stuck it out for the most part. That was a real tough life with Baba. Never but said what do we know about it? You know, but I don't know. But Baba gave him that a great task. So we feel inspired, we feel passionate, but poises poise and not losing enthusiasm or inspire true inspiration remaining balanced. I do not have that. So there is in passion, anger will 
easily come to the surface, so will uh, disappointment and all that. But through understanding poise, but through if your passion is for, what do you say, building your house on the rock? Build your house on Baba. Build yourself on Baba's word. No, I'm not. Pre I'm not a preacher. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the buck. Who else wants to, somebody else? Thank you, Ralph. Got a Let's volunteer, go. Jay Bobby. Let's go to Ron. One of the things that I think all of us uh, get ourselves wrapped up in and thus um, will potentially feel badly about or very good about <laughs> this you know the, the duality of life is what we do our actions and, and our behavior uh, this is this is something that Baba takes up in in this wonderful quote that's in the uh, uh, the practice, what is it? Uh, practical life with Mayor Baba or something like that. Uh, uh, practical spirituality is that's where I found this uh, quote. Uh, but I'm just going to give this one extra uh, excerpt from it. Uh, but what Baba is looking for, and that is, he says, do it, whatever that's going to be, do it as if it were the most important thing in the universe. Yet, let it be destroyed, ignored, or ridiculed beyond, uh, ridiculed completely. Or uh, let it be praised without elation. Leave the response to me or to God. So the response we have to leave to Baba. What we do, he wants us to go all the way. He wants us to not be afraid to do what we're going to do. Uh, if it's spontaneous or if it's planned or whatever it is, do it. It It is important, whether it fails, <laughs> whether people get criticize you or whether they praise you. It, that is Baba's part. The fruit of that uh, that doing. So I think that's an that's an important uh, part of, of keeping the heart clean and pure. Yeah. At least for me, it is. Yeah, throwing. I, I like. I mean, I I like a lot of what you said, but the you, bringing up, putting your whole heart into what you do, it's a lot easier said than done. Right. And then, and then if it doesn't work out, it's like, oh, well, I didn't care that much. Right. And then when you really put your heart into it, that's when Baba, I mean, I think I know for myself, I got, I call it like PTSD of the spiritual path. Right. Sometimes there's like situations in life where I'm like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to try to get invested into anything because I know how Baba works. He's going to use it against me later. But then he'll use that against you. And so it's, you know, it's a fine line because like I find myself in my life that I'm like, oh, that looks like something I'm going to be really, really into. I'm not going there. If I'm too connected to that, he's going to take it away. And, you know, it's like this. I think we have to draw this beautiful picture on a whiteboard for Baba. Like so incredible. We spend so much detail with our expo marker, making it beautiful. And we just we're looking at it. It's amazing. And Baba's beaming and it's. And then he snaps his fingers, erases it and says, do it again. And it's like each time you get better at it, each time the picture is more beautiful, but you get, you know, you could say you get addicted to suffering, but I think we also get addicted to the beauty that Baba lets us create and the beauty that our hearts create, right? You know, if you invest into a relationship, into a passion, whatever it might be, it is really beautiful. It's not all just suffering. It, it It's beautiful. But each time Baba has to carve out more space to create something even more beautiful. And, you know, I don't know if this is your experience, but what I found with Baba is 
when I am thinking too much and in the way and trying to figure out how to, what to do with my life and if I'm doing it right, if I'm pleasing Baba, I am so miserable. And when I'm really just living and loving and being free and just pouring my heart into whatever I do, I'm getting everything I've ever wanted. I mean, I, maybe like, does that make, I mean, is that relatable to you guys? Yeah. It's like when you don't care, Baba wants you to be happy. At least that's my experience, but. One of the things uh, about um, trying to be free uh, uh, of the I, me, mine uh, part of it is if you if if we use our words properly, uh, and I, when I say properly, I, I should say intelligently, uh, with with a spiritual sensibility, we can instead of saying my life, uh, just say life, because then it then it, life is is his, and so if we do this this is my life, you know, if we think of it in terms of this is my life that I have to do this for, um, it becomes, you become a little nervous about it. So that it'll reflect uh, specifically on, our, on, on oneself. But just think of it as you're in life, it's his life. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a transition I think that every Baba lover will make if, you know, at some point, I think that has to occur um, where it isn't your life anymore. It isn't Baba in your life. It's you in Baba's life. That, that's got to occur at some point in order to free you from, from that. And using those words, just eliminating those words will move you along faster in the accomplishment of that. Mm. Beautiful, Ron. You in Baba's life. Be you in Baba's life. That's very, means a lot to me. Thank you. Really beautifully said. Thank you, Ron. Well, are you raising your hand, Diane, or are you waving goodbye? <laughs> goodbye. Well, tonight's over because Diane raised her hand and said that it's time to go to sleep. So it's all her fault. If you guys had any thoughts that you wanted to share. No, I'm kidding. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> she said, that's enough. Um, RG. Oh, yeah. yeah. Bye, guys, by the way, I love all of you, but my name is not Margie. It's Margie. <laughs> Thank you, Margie. Thank you, Margie. Your name yeah. is Mar yeah. That's That's better than Margie. It's uh it's the name that Baba has taken on within me, so I want to be sure to protect it. It's the one he chose. I better not make fun of it. <laughs> no, I'm not, uh, no, I mean it's not that. Oh, it's okay. You can I mean it doesn't matter. But yeah, my name is Marty. Anyway, well, guys. Let's have, hey, actually, Bob, do you have a poem on hand? Um, he has one hot off the press. I had a feeling. He looked like it. He looked like he was suspicious. I <laughs> I had, I read one at RT that I just wrote today. So I, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share that again. It's uh, titled March Snow. <clears throat> Just after 6 a.m., get out of bed, hit the light switch, nothing. Wander, wandering around the house by flashlight. 7.30, lights on. Coffee poured, I sit in the same old chair, watching March snow through the same old window. Photo of your smiling face in the same old place. Every moment new, every moment a gift from you, not measured by a second hand, measureless as snow, each flake falling to its destiny with countless brothers and sisters, all you, only you, falling, piling, 
bearing cars, sidewalks, bending trees and lilacs, falling, falling, melting to rise again, fall again. Early morning monkey mind tempted your bob to feel old, alone in this same old place. Every moment, same old, same old. But then, suddenly, open space, you ever knew. Mind mumbled, it's only relief because electricity came back. <laughs> Foolish, ignorant monkey, you should know by now such joy is a gift only beloved Baba can bestow. Afternoon now, and the pool of love you said is within everyone is still open. You, the sole lifeguard. Here I am for another dip after walking through deep drifts and shoveling the sidewalks. Mind tries again, asks, why do you try to write about such joy? My answer, this scribbling somehow stretches joy, helps it last, helps me remember you, Baba, in thankfulness a little longer, a few more moments, minutes, hours, not getting caught up in thoughts and worries, falling countless as flakes, piling, weighing, breaking, but instead, limbs of heart with your help shake off the weight and spring back to joy. Thank you, beloved Baba. Thank you. Beautiful. That's beautiful, Bob. Yeah. Now, uh, Thank you're you such both. a really beautiful writer. So let's have a moment of silence. But and just before that, down below, it says, Margie means one who is on the path. So we better call you Margie. You better call me Margie then. Uh-oh. Call <laughs> <laughs> you Margie until you, you know, you make some progress. <laughs> you know what's funny is I remember Sonobar telling me that when I was in India. But every time I've ever gone to India, she's the only person who has told me that because I think she understands how my name is spelled. Whenever I've told people my name, they always think I'm saying chicken because murgi is chicken in Hindi. And so everywhere I've gone, when I traveled all over India, they were murgi, 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 chicken, chicken, chicken. So, so uh -huh. they are correcting that. Uh. All right, guys, let's have a moment of silence and then we'll do Baba's Jays. Avatar, Meher Baba, Avatar, Meher Baba, Avatar, Meher Baba, I think you're the